Well, when you start the year, you need to connect with a few people who make you feel like everything's going to be okay, especially in a country like South Africa, where some of the time we have every reason to be a little pessimistic, if not cynical, if not realistic. And one of the people I love talking to is Fred Road. He is um, somebody I've spoken to many, many times. He's been a part of the Cliff Central family virtually from the get-go. He's also the founder and CEO of Heavy Chef, which is a learning platform for entrepreneurs. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have been a guest of his a couple of times too. And of course, Heavy Chef, for those who don't know, comes from that brilliant saying, never trust a skinny or thin chef. And they try to share things that people all over the world have learned about any number of topics. And each week they dish up thousands of short form video learning bites to a fast growing community of entrepreneurs. And having been one of these entrepreneurs myself, I've found it extremely useful to check in with Fred every now and then. He's the co-founder of the organization and the foundation, which provides learning programs, of course, for high potential earning and, uh, and, and emerging entrepreneurs. Um, Fred's also uh, the, the son of, of Danish uh, parents, so he's, he's, he's not pretending to be a Viking, and he doesn't just look like one. He actually is one, and uh, he's crazy. He's also insane. He's one of those people you could sometimes very, very clearly see belongs in a mental institution. Now, all of that, which is a fairly you know, belligerent introduction from me is just part of the reason that we love talking to him, but I'm, I'm so happy he's made some time for us today. Fred, it's such a pleasure. How are you, my friend? Yeah, very good. Thank you, Gary. All the better to be speaking with you. And I'm, uh, I'm glad I can, I can hopefully bring some positivity <laughs> in amongst well, all the doom and gloom, which we're confronted with. I mean, you, you, you're realistic. You're not pessimistic and you're not optimistic. Um, I'm, I'm sometimes an optimist and then I, you know, very quickly learn a few hard lessons. And then I go, oh, you've got to, you mustn't be so optimistic for no good reason. And then when I'm negative, which also happens to me sometimes, and I get pessimistic, then I think, well, look how much fun, good stuff you're missing out on. Somewhere in the middle, it's important to kind of, you know, have in, in your circle of, of people that you talk to, people who are a little bit of all of those things. And I, I do put you more on the optimistic side of things, but I think you're quite realistic. You know, you've got your feet on the ground. You've seen a lot of businesses come and go. You've seen a lot of entrepreneurs. You know a lot of these people. You've spoken to them like I have. And I think it kind of enriches you. Um, it gives you a, a very balanced view of how the world really works because too many people just sit in the gloom or sit in this blind optimism and they're only getting a third of the story. I agree. I, I mean, thank you for that. Uh, I think that is fairly accurate. I hope it is because, um, I mean, Heavy Chef is predicated, the, the idea of Heavy Chef is predicated on, uh, on, on eat your own food. So, you know, right. in a world of talkers, it's the doers that are going to change it. So our, you know, our whole premise is, is of realism and the fact that, you know, the people that we feature on our platform are people who not just academically speak about things they can speak from you know experience and they've been in the kitchen they've eaten their own food and um and they are a domain authority on whatever the topic or theme or category that we, we we're trying to unpack um and you know to your point about blind optimists one of my favorites uh you know in fact if not my my favorite saying of all time is um uh is the of the stockdale paradox i mean i'm sure many of your your listeners have have read uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins, where he says he relates the story of, of Admiral James Stockdale, uh, a prisoner of war, you know, in the most brutal conditions in Southeast Asia, where he and a small group of his followers were the only ones to survive after, you know, everyone else had been tortured and massacred and so on and so forth. And when they were asked, you know, how did he survive? He said, well, you know, we confront the brutal facts, but we never give up hope. And I think that, you know, that duality of view, that perspective is really important. You know, we, we have to confront the brutal facts. We've got to be honest about what's going on around us. But, you know, life, I mean, in the, I mean, Jung calls this life thing, you know, a numinous pause in, in amongst two continuums of, of infinity. You know, so we're this tiny little blip of light you may as well right. spend it being or doing something meaningful and, and impactful. And, uh, and that, you know, it forces us, particularly as entrepreneurs, to, to be optimistic. It's in our DNA. 
So all these people that you've spoken to, and I mean, you've <clears throat> quite apart from Heavy Chef, you've also you've got a number of accolades in the advertising world, and you've been one of the people who I think the advertising world has also looked to for original ideas and for kind of breakthrough stuff. And really, that whole universe of advertising has just changed completely in the last twenty years. It's it's barely recognizable to the people who would have been in it twenty years ago. What is the what is the most important thing you think about today? And how people are getting it right and how people are getting it wrong now. I mean, the internet obviously has got to be the biggest part of that answer, but I'm I'm not going to I'm not gonna kind of proffer answers where someone like you has spoken to everyone over the course of the last few years that is connected to that world. And and, and you must have some sort of summary in your head, some sort of precy of where the advertising world is now. Well, it's interesting, you know, I mean, there's, there's advertising, I mean, certainly uh, to your point, I think the, the, you know, the sands are shifting underneath the industry, but it, but it's, that's not a new thing. I think they have been evolving for, you know, f- you know, I suppose since advertising began, but it sure. kind of settled in the eighties and nineties where you had these kind of four big streams of, uh, and, and a system really, which was actually very profitable for many big agencies where you had, you know, print, outdoor, radio, and TV that dominated in terms of an advertising agency and, and the advertising departments and corporates would, you know, the, the, the MO, the, you know, the methodology would be come up with a great idea. So you'd feed your junior creatives with a lot of pizza and beer, and they would come up with this amazing, disruptive, innovative, quirky idea. And that idea would become the kernel to then replicate through those four channels. You know, so it, it was a very systematic approach to delivering a message from one to many. So you'd have these broadcast channels, which gave you the power of people's attention. And, you know, those four channels were essentially, you know, they made some, some advertising people rich. They made uh, uh, advertising executives in corporate houses very happy. But then all of a sudden this, this, this fifth thing, this fifth channel, um, you know, channel number five came along, uh, which was the internet, right? And and um, and uh, and so so, you know, people just had this because you know, it's it's very easy to fall back into past behavior. You think, okay, well, let's just add the idea to channel number five. But what they didn't realize is it's kind of like channel number five hundred because that that fifth channel. First of all, it's not a channel because the internet and digital kind of threads through everything else and you know, print, radio, TV and outdoor were actually becoming digital in their own right. But there were so many subdivisions to the internet and to digital communications that there was no way that you could have one junior sitting at the side of the agency or you know, the, the advertising department who could look after all your digital uh, material. And so it was very disruptive and very difficult okay. for certainly the big they all started off by just kind of giving this little room off to the side yeah. to all these people. They didn't yeah. really know. I mean, all the smartest people that I've ever spoken to in advertising were completely perplexed by this thing. And honest to God, none of them, have, even, even the, the least honest of them, and there are a lot of those, have said that they didn't give it as much credit as they probably should have. And in the early days, especially, they thought it was a bit of a joke, you know, so they put it at yeah. the back of the queue and they said, oh, well, look, we've got to be seen to be paying attention to this. Otherwise, our clients will think we're not paying attention to the future. And then they just let it sort of stew for a while. And if some tiny bit of the profit came from there, they said, oh, well done. And they never gave any of it back to those people or put it back into that department. They just carried on paying attention until very, very recently to, yeah. you know, those four channels that you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, we didn't do, as digital agency um, heads, we didn't do ourselves any favor. We had, like, this cocky nerd problem whereby <laughs> suddenly we were the, the shiny thing, and as a result, we, you know, came in and pretended that we were the smartest guy in the room. And actually, we were just, like, making shit up as we went along. And so, you know, there was this huge amount of confusion. And frankly, there still is in a lot of this kind of stuff. But the reality is that those shifting sands are becoming, you know, like like an earthquake now because we have, you know, we have not just machine learning, but we've got deep learning and we've got artificial intelligence. We've got, 
the Web3, we've got, you know, the, all the mechanisms and scaffolding for, for, um, for crypto suddenly becoming a very viable and, and validated mechanism for a, a way of disrupting your own business. And so, you know, business owners, certainly some of the big business owners are faced with this terrible choice, like, like how do we compete in this, in this world where effectively, you know, a thousand people can be replaced by a single algorithm? And, um, and I th you know, the, the challenges that we faced in the 2000s are nothing compared to mm. challenges we are about to face in this upcoming decade. So, you know, I think that um, it's going to be a very interesting time. And, and ultimately, interestingly, I think that, you know, the people who embrace the technology at an early stage and really look for opportunities to, um, to play, to be curious, to be creative and to be innovative within are the ones that are going to to really bear fruit in, uh, in in the beginning of the next decade because you know frankly nobody even the smartest dudes and, and as you know Gareth I mean I've spoken to literally thousands of people and yeah. and again everybody's making stuff up as they go along very few people really know what the hell is going on and even those people are, they you know they kind of put a big strong disclaimer as like oh like, yeah hey. Well, it's the wild west at the moment, you know. I mean, you can even see Elon doing that now with his new adventures with Twitter. But you know, he's got a, he's yeah. got a track record of tremendous success behind him. But he's very careful because he knows that the, the future is less predictable than it than it may seem. Yeah. So, so there's an interesting overlap, Fred, and I, this is another reason why you're a great guy to talk to because you're interested in business, you're interested in advertising, you're interested in technology, but you're also like a really kind of feet on the ground pragmatist, and you. You pay attention to what what trends are going on, and I, I'm I'm really curious because it's my flavor of the month fascination at the moment is is AI, and if you look at this Open uh, GTP and uh, or Open AI and, and Chat GPT or whatever it is, I mean these things are absolutely frightening. They're first of all still in the in the early stages, so it's not what it may be one day. But if you look at what these things are doing and how they will replace humans in terms of like written and creative and, and, and intellectual and conceptual stuff. This is an area that we always thought would be, you know, we'd be safe from the machines. You know, white collar workers and creatives in inverted commas were the people who always thought, oh, no, no, well, you know, they may take away that job that the guy at the production plant has and they may automate certain people out of work, you know, the, the call centers or that kind of thing, but not this. This is safe territory and now it's not so safe. What do you what do you think of all of this? It, it really isn't safe, you know. I mean, there's so much going on that it's very difficult to kind of quantify it in a in a single kind of soundbite for the purposes of this conversation. But I, you know, Gareth, you've got time. I mean, just, no one. Just... I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you talk. <laughs> uh, I'll let you talk all day if you want to about uh, you know this this artificial intelligence stuff. We we could talk all yeah. I mean the reality is I mean even you mentioned Elon like he I, I believe it was last week he was saying you know he 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 almost distanced himself from Twitter but by saying you know um, uh, Instagram makes people depressed and Twitter makes people angry <laughs> and he was saying right. you know this is this is really a minefield in terms of what what we're dealing with in terms of the network and the network effect of people but. The extraordinary thing is that he was one of the the um, the early investors and and you know um, protagonists of an AI and and so if you look at what um, ChatGPT is and the the mechanisms that he's creating, I mean, you know, everything is disrupting everything else, and so again, these shifting sands becoming a, an earthquake. It's it's very difficult to to kind of predict the future, but what you can say is that. There's a lot of interesting things going on. And um, I mean, recently we saw, for example, you know, people, to your point, you know, there's a lot of t technical and tactile skills that will be replaced by robots and, and machine learning. You know, the ability to do very simple, repetitive tasks quickly. But people would say, well, okay, but then what about the, the creative skills? What about writing? What about art? But that's just been blown out the water. You know, now we're seeing very, very uh, compelling artwork and creative output that's being developed by artificial intelligence. So you have, 
I mean, an example would be um, there was recently a, a, a very famous conductor, I can't remember his name, but you know, he, he was asked to discern between you know, a, a, um, a famous uh, concerto by a famous uh, um, composer versus a, uh, a concerto that was created artificially. And, and yeah. he couldn't. He, he could not discern the difference between a piece of music. Now, that's extraordinary because now all of a sudden you're seeing art, you're seeing creative work, you're seeing poetry, right. you're seeing, you know, um, uh, there was, a, I think it was one of the big intellectual guys. Was, I think it was, it might have been um, Jordan Peterson was saying that he, he instructed chat GPT to, to write. It was for his, he wrote a book called 12 rules for life or something. And he, he instructed right. chat GPT to write a 13th rule for life, but right. uh, in, in a, in a form of the King James Bible and make it plausible and, and right. relatable to philosophy. And when he read it, I mean, he went, he was sitting on stage. He was saying it was, it was actually quite, it was pretty freaking plausible, you know? And, and, when you when you start thinking about the ramifications of that, it's I mean that's it's either terrifying or very very exciting, but um, but yeah I mean I don't have I I don't have any kind of golden solutions or, or or advice for people. What I can say is that you know more now more than ever it is very much there is a and and this is also related to what many of the people who are on the heavy chef platform are saying. You know it, it, now more than ever I think given all the incendiary confrontations and, and scenarios around the globe. It's, it's, it's important for those who, who really do have that kind of predilection to do something meaningful, to do something that's impactive, even if it's a boring thing. But yeah. if you do something, then try and do it in such a way that you give it your best shot um, and really lean into it in, in such a way. And certainly, I mean, obviously my lens is, is entrepreneur. So, you know, to me, like it's like a hammer, everything looks like a nail, you know, on the entrepreneurial aspect, it's, it's, you know, do something that gives you purpose. It doesn't have to be completely, well, you know, like the most sexy thing ever. It can be boring, I mean, but as long as you, you, you do it well enough to employ a few more people and make a tiny little impact in your patch of, of this I mean, green Fred, planet. I keep you know? saying to people, you know, people who say, oh, it's really hard and, you know, it's tough and, you know, there, there are all these policies and labor laws and it makes it difficult for people. And you hear people complaining and finding reasons to be miserable. And I, I say to them, listen, there are people who have made a living enough to live and not a bad life either, by the way, just by unboxing shit on the Internet. I mean, there are people who make an unboxing video once a week. That's all they do. And they make a killing. Now, if someone can do that, you know, what excuse do you and I have to not? To not try and make an impact, right? So you, you're spot on. All, all you have to do is pick up a copy of Factfulness by Hans Rosling. And uh, it's such a great book because it essentially pulls you back into reality. And Or you mm. can do some cursory research where, you know, you, you look at what life was like 100 years ago. You know, I mean, there's an experiment and um, I can't remember who, who did it. But it's like it was a professor who asked his students to look at this very idyllic uh, painting of a fireside scene in a you know in a very kind of homely um uh, farmhouse in in the you know the the the, the west the, the 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 old west in the united states and that he asked his students like what is this like do you think life is better then or better now you know mm -hmm. as you know there's a baby in a, in a cut and you know they're eating soup and and it just looked really warm and beautiful. But but then, you know, everybody was like, oh, that's much better than today. Today is all about violence and crime and conflicts and whatever. <laughs> and then he was like, well, okay, let me tell you the truth about this picture. And it's like that baby's not going to live. That food that they're eating t is completely tasteless. And it's it's actually, you know, it's water with like, you know, terribly unnutritious stuff. And it's you know, most of the, 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 the people in that room are going to die of either smallpox or polio or some kind of really horrible disease. And, you know, many of the things, I mean, to speak, you know, uh, you know, to, to, to father refer... probably, the father probably had to fight, uh, you know, every single day with, with pistol on his hip 
in order to make it through the day. They probably had to hunt for that little bit of food. Um, they had to fight other people for territory. They never knew whether they were going to make it through the day. And their life expectancy was like 35, maybe 40 if they were lucky. Dude, there was a reason why they called it the Wild West. It was friggin' wild, yeah. you know? And now our, you know, I mean, even in third world countries, our, you, you know, um, uh, our expected life, uh, our, our life expectancy is, has increased by an order of magnitude. So, mm -hmm. so if you lived in, say, New York, um, you'd have to contend with li quite literally a rising tide of horse shit because that was how people used to travel. You know, right. the traffic jams were awful because horses would die, back up traffic, and they'd have to remove the horse from like, you know, you know, right outside Madison Square Gardens. And no, I mean, and that's the reality of... Not to, not to mention like human sewerage, which was only really yeah. sorted out in the early 1900s to late 1800s. Before that, people literally threw the stuff out onto the street in buckets. And if you were walking sure. by, you got human turd on you. I mean, it's, you know, it makes yeah. Durban Beachfront look like it's, uh, it's clean <laughs> at the moment with their warnings about all the stuff floating in there. So you mentioned the Wild West, and I think that's apposite because we're kind of in the Wild West. If South Africa is anything, and, and I know that sure. you look upon South Africa as a, you know, you came back here from Denmark when you saw something on TV with Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and you thought, well, that's the that's place right. I want to make. Now, this place sure. is, is the new Wild West because we have huge problems to solve. There are massive frontier businesses and opportunities in South Africa. There's basic, basic stuff that people can't get hold of or can't do because we are left behind. We've, we've especially under this government, found ourselves increasingly at their mercy, left behind technologically, yeah. You know, our laws are, are, are not necessarily fit for purpose. We've got people who are incompetent and don't have the merit to obtain and, and hold the positions that they do, both in business and in politics. And that creates opportunity. That makes that opens the field. It doesn't close it down. Yeah. Because where yeah. we have problems, we need people who have solutions, and those people can make a handsome profit. Yeah, agreed. And, and I see many of the entrepreneurs within our community are – you know, they're seeing South Africa as, as a kind of a petri dish to have their experiments validated. And, and once you get that validation, once you get that tiny little spark, that kernel of, of uh, affirmation from your, your target audience, you can then replicate that internationally. It's not easy. It's certainly there's huge challenges within that, but it is becoming easier. And I think with global trade starting to open up and people looking at Africa as you know, sometimes an emotional purchase, but certainly a storied purchase. You can start to use the Africa problem to your your advantage. And, and I think it just depends on how you frame it. That's true of everything in every walk of life. But I, I do think it's important that, that, um, that we do that. Otherwise, what are you going to do? You know, yeah. you can... You can go and live overseas, sure. But let me tell you, it's not all that it's cracked up to do. I mean, I've spoken to many, many, many people who've moved over. And, and to a fault, everybody misses home. Everybody misses South Africa, you know, because there is something special here. And, and again, you know, confront the brutal facts, but never give up hope. The brutal facts are that things are pretty freaking dire at the moment. We have, I think the biggest challenge we face is a leadership crisis. We don't know how to lead. You know, leading is at the moment, it's just in a complete vacuum and, and or leadership is in a complete vacuum. And, and the, 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 the hard things that we need to do are just not being done. And so, I, you know, from my personal perspective and in my small patch of, of the planet, you know, I'm calling on the people that I know to, to initiate a form of a bottom-up revolution as opposed to waiting for for top-down change because you know we can't control that we can't control the legacy and the system that's been put in place and just the absolute you know complete incompetence that that we're seeing but we can initiate small changes and let me tell you you know the world is full of precedent of a small group of people creating disproportionate impact and Absolutely. and that is most most certainly true in the entrepreneurial community so um, I, I guess that's what we're trying to do. And that's the, the framework that we, we're trying to create at Heavy Chef. But it's also a personal framework because, again, you know, I've seen it. I've seen how small 
community, small groups of people in, in my own personal life and in business and, and with the people that I've worked with have just achieved the most extraordinary outcomes. Yeah, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up too, because people always think it takes, you know, thousands and thousands of people and you need a groundswell. And in order to create a revolution, you need this enormous majority of people behind you. And that's not true. A small number of people almost always create the world's biggest change, whether it's technological, whether it's political, whether it's cultural, it doesn't actually take a lot of people. It takes a small intransigent or forward thinking minority to push things forward. Um, the Enlightenment yeah, wasn't, you know, the work of millions of people across the continent of Europe. Um, the, the development of, of most of our modern technology hasn't happened because everyone on earth was working on things at the same time. Um, the French Revolution was a, a small group of middle class Frenchmen in Parisian cafes. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not the kind of thing that we think when we think big change, we immediately assume, you know, armies and, and, and vast resources and companies that control billions and billions of dollars. It really isn't. And I think we on the, right. in South Africa are always on the precipice of like, oh, things could go really horribly wrong, and they do often. But also things could suddenly turn. And before you know it, you're sitting in the land of milk and honey because this place could very easily become that with a little bit of what you yeah. rightly point out is leadership. But what, I mean, in all your discussions with people, what do you think the key components of leadership really are? Um, you mentioned how it's become very hard to find the right leaders. Do you think that part of the problem, I'm asking you a few questions in one here, but a part, yeah. a part of the problem is that leaders have become like people who are trying to be popular or people who are trying to get clout rather than real influence? Yeah, look, I mean, certainly truth, you know, actually understanding what truth means to you is really important. It speaks to value. So what do you value? If you value something, you need to be damn sure that that comes from a place of honesty, that there is something that you can actually stand up in public and it can be defensible. So you have a cogent, logical, rational and understanding and and, uh, and and explanation for what you're saying and not to kind of pander to the public or the audience that you see in front of you I think you, you've got to do it from a place of honesty and that's that's you know that again there's precedent across the world I mean we've seen you know in Singapore and uh, you see it in in Estonia you see it in small little pockets where extraordinary changes have made from the most dire circumstances I mean people forget that South Korea like six Decades ago, it was the same GDP uh, or thereabouts as like Rwanda, you know? Yeah. Like, how do you affect that form of change in like six? It's not G20 country, you know? Singapore is again, like, you know, they went for efficiency and, 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 um, and, and, and merit, uh, you know, when they, um, when they made decisions. And I think, you know, I mean, Denmark, which is where my family comes from, is a social democratic system. But there is still, and, and I think there is a balance. Like obviously, we've got to look after our own and, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, you know, we've got to succeed at the basics. That means we've got to make some hard decisions. And, um, you know, and sometimes those decisions are going to be unpopular and you need to be able to face the music for those, those decisions. So I'm a huge and, believer and, in you know, understanding very, very centrally what, what is meaningful to you, being able to defend it, and then being able to deliver a message that actually is often very unpopular to, to follow through on that, if that makes sense. Well, yes, no, that's a, that's a, a great answer. And I'm just picking up on, on the word meaningful. And, and, you know, again, you mentioned hard decisions. I think hard decisions are never going to come from soft people. And soft people are inevitably the ones who haven't really thought about meaning properly. Because if you're, if you're in a tough situation, every decision you make is going to be hard because it's about survival, right? And if you've got options, especially in, a, in the modern world where we have so many options, and you know, if, if things like COVID taught us anything, it's that we're extremely adaptable. So people can, in a tough situation, make difficult decisions, but... Most of the time, they don't. They, they go with the soft option or they just sit and wait for someone else to make the decision for them, whether it's a leader, in inverted yeah. commas, or not. And, and that, that word meaning, 
is tremendously important. You know, I've, I've read Viktor Frankl's In Search of Meaning, and I've, I've heard yeah. innumerable people of the caliber that you, you talked on, on Heavy Chef, talking about meaning and, and purpose and what all of that is actually about. It's very, very difficult to define because for every single person, it's going to be a little bit different. But essentially, if you wake up in the morning and what you, what you have to do that day isn't important and you don't feel it's important and you don't really make a difference in someone else's life, let alone your own, you're buggering yeah. around. You shouldn't be looking for leadership to help you. The problem is within. Yeah, I, I, I concur with that. And I, I think you look at some of the people who have affected the most amount of impact in the world. You know, somebody like Muhammad Yunus, who you'll probably know, it's, you know, he founded uh, Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. And he was widely credited with the, the upturn in the, the economy in Bangladesh in the, in the late 70s and 80s. And, you know, it, again, a small group of people making disproportionate change and taking an idea. And I, to your point earlier, it's often an idea when it's back to that conviction, when you fully align it to your values and, and you, you imbue meaning within it. There's a storytelling compelling, uh, component to it. But at the end of the day, it's about taking that idea and converting it into action. And I think this is the thing that people miss is that people are so, um, uh, they're so despondent. And, and, you know, I think the media has a, has a role to play in this, but they're so despondent about the, the chances of them succeeding and that idea actually bearing fruit that they don't even try. And, and here's the thing is like, you, what have you got to lose? Like try, just give it a shot because, the, you know, we live in eye blink. So, I think it's riskier not to try and, and, you know, to live this meaningless life where you're just moaning and complaining all the time, you know, confront the brutal facts, understand how difficult it is because it is like we, you just have to drive through Jack or kids it in with this recently done and, you know, try to dodge bottles and so on and so forth, which is just, it's nobody's idea of fun. But the reality is, is, you know, it, there are there's work to be done. And, um, you know, I think, I think people, there's, so I'm, I'm actually currently, Gareth, I'm sitting at, at Workshop 17, right? So there's right. a, there's a whole bunch of tech, tech businesses here and whatnot. And there's a, um, I met an Estonian guy who, who moved here with his team and you know, he wanted to set up his business, uh, a global business, which was a, mm -hmm. um, a tech platform for buying cars. And, um, he wanted to do it from Cape Town because Cape Town is a beautiful place and, you know, there's lots of creative talent here and so on and so forth. And he was telling me about Estonia and the story of Estonia, which I don't know if you know, but it's an amazing tech culture there. There's a real, um, there's a, a resurgent economy based primarily on the tech sector within Estonia and talent is now this hotbed of tech talent. And one of the things that this guy told me was that, you know, the, the the founding team of Skype, which is you know it's like an OG of the tech the tech category. Um, yeah. When when they started, it was two Scandinavian guys that were the co-founders, but their team was all Estonian, right? So when they sold the business, I think it was to eBay. Um, I believe it was to eBay anyway for like an unholy amount of money back then. Yes, it took their money. Microsoft. They could have gone and I think Microsoft it, bought it. it. It was, yeah, I think I think it was sold to eBay and then Microsoft bought it from eBay or something like that. But anyway, nonetheless, it was, they were sitting with a shit ton of money, right? And then, like, what do you do with money? You can sit there and you can go and buy a yacht and swan around and, you know, eat caviar in and the, and the Baltics and whatnot. But, like, they didn't do that. They went back to Estonia and they started reinvesting into the ecosystem and, you know, mentoring and providing resources and, and reducing the red tape and getting involved at a... At a, at a political level, you know, and, and really kind of easing it up for the entrepreneurs there. I'm told, and, and I, I believe it to be true, they have five unicorns in a, um, since then, and it's in the space of the last decade, um, based upon that small ecosystem of, of talent that was then reinvigorated, again, by three individuals who really wanted to make an impact. Now, if right. you think about that, up until recently in Africa, of you know, a population of 1.5 billion people, we had and a half. But, but 
you, you know, and that's in a billion and a half people. This is a population, Estonia is roughly about 1.3 million people. Um, and, and within there, they were able to foster within a tiny group of people, a subset of that 1.3 million people, you know, this, this crop of unicorns. And so, look, I'm not a big fan of the, the, even the term unicorn, and I don't believe we should be aspiring to create unicorns in South Africa. I mean, um, a friend of mine was saying, you know, instead of looking for 10 unicorns, we should be looking for 10,000 gazelles or zebras, or whatever we want to turn them, our term for, for African companies, which are like smaller and nimble and, and you know, instead of a thousand people, they have a hundred people well, within I mean, their team, Fred, you know. You know, first things first, just to, to address this, this question of gazelles and, and, you know, Africa, anyone who has managed to survive in business as a small business owner in South yes. Africa for the last 10 years, you already, please let me tell you, and I, I mean this not in any patronizing way to anybody yeah. who's listening to this interview now or watching us, and you've gone through hell, and I know it's, it's you know, in any other place and time, you might have been a, a billionaire already, but if you've survived the kinds of things that South African businesses have to survive, electricity, you know, the government, uh, riots, floods, God knows what else people have put up with. And that's just in the last two years, let alone the last 10 and a continual downward uh, trajectory in the economy. Let me tell you something to survive right now. You've proven that you've got some serious, strong metal in you. You're made of good stuff. Just to the other thing to talk about Skype, I've got this to show you. Um, I don't know if you can still see there, but it says that um, my best wishes. It's from Bill Draper, who's one of the he was one of the first investors yeah, in Skype. Investors, investors, and, yeah, amazing. Yeah, and I met I met him in in Silicon Valley a while ago, and he was telling yeah, me about that team that started guy. Skype. Very smart guy, but but he didn't invent Skype. He was just an investor in it. He spotted the people who yeah. had the talent to develop it. These people you're talking about, yeah. and I'll tell yeah. you something, and this is probably true for you as well. I've met hundreds if not thousands of south africans who are also talented people who are finding the gaps they're fixing problems they're coming up with either technical or just labor solutions to some of the problems that we have in this country and i'll tell you what despite the fact that we have one of the most useless governments we have some of the smartest people 100 percent, i couldn't agree with you more and here's just something to add to that gareth is that there is money, you know, there is money floating around and there's intentional money that is looking for those smart people that you, you're you mentioning that if you have a good idea and it is focused and it's scalable and that it has, there is a addressable market, they will invest in you. And, and you know, I think one of the things that I just want to encourage anyone who listens to this, you know, is don't, don't sell yourself short. Like think, think you know, medium yeah. to big, like really kind of, you know, back yourself, do something impactful. Because frankly, the people that certainly I've met in, in the heavy chef community, and I'm, you know, I know that you know, Gareth, in terms of your community, we can compete with the best in the world. You know? And if you think about our exports, the diaspora of South Africans who are out there doing crazy, incredible things, forget Elon and Charlize and Trevor. I mean, you talk about all the tech industry, the investors, people like Rula Puerta and so on and so forth, like they just pulled it in everywhere. You know, they're like our, our Illuminati, you know, yeah. and, and, and frankly, they're doing amazing things. People love South Africans because we're resilient, we're smart, we're street smart, and, um, and we know how to make things work in adverse conditions. So back yourself. You know? Absolutely right. Yeah, I, I don't know where it comes from, and you and I can get quite philosophical, I'm sure. It might not be the right place to do it, about why it is that we feel we constantly need to beat ourselves up about how we could do more. We could be better. We could be here. We could do that instead of sure. like taking stock of all the things we've done, which is why I mentioned just after you'd explained the Skype story, why I'm, I'm always so impressed by South African businesses that have survived the last 10 years. It's, it's truly yeah. miraculous. So when you interview these people, there must be a couple of like tremendous aha moments that you have while talking to them, because I know, in almost every interview I've had with everybody that I've spoken to, with very few exceptions, you know, that if there's someone who's really boring or uninteresting, it's usually my fault, not theirs. They, they, they teach you things and you have these moments of like, you know, on the Damascus road where you see the sign and you're talking to somebody and suddenly something goes click. And for you, it must've happened a few times. Who, who are the people who've really just hit you 
in the gut with some enormous realization, revelation, piece of wisdom. And who are the ones that you cannot get enough of talking to? <laughs> Cheapest. That's that's a tricky. I think you know that's a tricky question because that's like yeah. you know he's your favorite kid. And I mean, uh, so there's there's a lot of I think there's, your a, favorite lot. there's a lot of people. You know, that can, yeah. I got you. <laughs> yeah. There, there's no, but Gareth. I mean, I think what I can say is that there there have been some there have been some extraordinary surprises. And one of the things that I, I'll say to, just because it comes to mind as as we're talking is that. You know, when you speak about the the you know the fact that we have all this talent and 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 you know we, we don't necessarily back ourselves um, to the hilt. Part of it is is storytelling. I don't think we tell our, our story very well, and I think that's that's weird because we have a very creative populace. Like there's you know, I mean, just take advertising. My background, you know, we we used to be. The, the the underdogs that that just you know kicked everyone's asses in advertising you know um we had some of the finest advertising talent in the 80s and 90s and, and the early 2000s like everybody just couldn't believe how good this relatively small group of agencies would you know create this world beating work and yeah. and so we have the ability to tell the stories but for some reason in the business world and our celebrity culture it, it, I, I don't know why. I, I mean, maybe it's a tall puppy thing. Maybe it's a thing of not, you know, there's a baked in uh, imposter syndrome or something like that. But we should. Yeah. We need to learn how to do that. I mean, an example would be like how many people know that Monster Energy drinks, you know, were started by South Africans. And by the way, we're the top performing stock in America for the last like three decades. I mean, it's just nuts. You know, we have this story that nobody knows. And, um, you know, we've got so many unbelievably strong business uh, case studies that we could point to. But, you know, so an example, and to answer your question, you know, I, I go on these yearly road trips where I actually go into the communities and I look for entrepreneurs. I bring my backpack and I've got like, I literally have like a camera set and I've got sound equipment and whatnot. And I, I speak to people who are running their own businesses. And uh, a, you know, a mutual friend of mine, um, a friend of a friend's, uh, he runs a church in KZN and he was saying, look, there's this really amazing uh, woman in my, in my community and she's doing great stuff. And, you know, I said, cool, I want to meet her. It was outside of Belito and she's a farmer. Right. And so I went to this, uh, to meet this lady. Her name is Nonkankla Joy. And um, she runs a company called Umgibe, right. Which mm -hmm. I'd never heard of before. Never. And I'd never come across her before. And, so she comes into you know in, into the meeting space and um, she's a short, unassuming person. She's slightly like cocky, a little bit pugnacious. She looks at you like you know, like if she wants to throat punch you. And then and then I said to her, look, you know, Nonklankla, it's an absolute pleasure to meet you. She says, no, 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 you must call me my joy. Um, you young people, you're so rude. And she says, so I was like, I'm really sorry. You know, my joy. It's an honor to meet you. And so she started telling her story and it's so happy. I mean, I'll give you the very brief crazy of it is that in, I think it was like 2014 or 2015, she was diagnosed with quite a progressive cancer and she, you know, her husband wasn't around and she had kids and she had to provide for her family. She lost her job. She, uh, she, the thing that she knew was farming. She started uh, essentially iterating her farming um, techniques and, um, the problem that she was trying to solve in entrepreneurial language was that the chickens in her plot were, were taking the seeds out of the ground. So she innovated a way of raising the crops using farm materials, basically secondhand materials, um, and uh, and an irrigation system that she designed herself, right? And in the church, there was a, a patent lawyer who you know helped her to patent the system. And the, the long the long story short version of it is that. She, um, I think it was two years ago or three years ago, maybe she she had grown the company to such an extent that she was importing the kits and the the, the produce to countries across Africa, particularly like Uganda and, and Nigeria and so on and so forth. And and these kits were being used in farming communities uh, across Africa and internationally. And um, and she. Uh, she won the World Entrepreneur of the Year Award at Impact 2 in Paris. And the prize 
was given to her by none other than Grim, the Muhammad Yunus uh, of Grameen Bank, wow. and who was her hero. And so she was telling me the story, and I was sitting with my back. I thought, shit, I need like a full-on freaking international film crew for this woman because she was so impressive. And her story was so impactful to me. I mean, I was in tears. I was just like, See, you're yeah. incredible, you know? I, so I didn't ask you that question to try and trap you because I was feeling lazy. But the story that you've told now is an unexpected one. You know, people always think you're going to say, and this is why when they ask me that same question, I never, I struggle for an answer too. But then when I think about it, it's usually not the famous people or the heavy hitters yeah. or the ones who've got, you know, billion dollar corporations under their control or they've run countries or whatever. It's stories like my joys. You know, this is, yeah. this is the kind of thing that changes lives and yeah. at a level that she's just trying to solve a problem. Like the chickens yeah. are eating the seeds. Now we need yeah. to figure a way around that. And she's come up with something truly thoughtful and creative. I love it. Yeah. And no AI is going to steal her job from her anytime <laughs> soon. Is it? Right. 100%. And okay, I think, so for, you know, there's, yeah. No, no, go on. There's. No, I think, I think that the, the idea and, and I, you know, we're all a bit lazy. And I think one of the things is we rely on the media to feed us the stories that it curates and believes to be yeah. the most important. To us. That's a flawed model. We should not be doing that. And particularly looking at things like Twitter and, the, you know, the algorithms that are, essentially seeing us as the, you know, everyone knows this, you know, we are the, uh, the product. And so, yeah. so our attention is the currency and, and we need to, a, a friend of mine, a, a really good friend of mine, he, he talks about the gold, like a bag of gold coins and your attention should be like a bag of gold coins. Use it wisely. You know, when you give something your attention, a really zero in on it, like reach into the bag, take out the coin and go like this, what I'm doing right now actually has value. And so be intentional about who you look at, who you speak to, where you look for the stories and, and how you're discerning your response to those stories that are being fed to us by the media. Because, you know, I think, I think in, in, if I was in charge of education now, then critical thinking would be the foremost uh, topic of education that should be taught to, to kids yeah. and, and, and well, young adults. I mean Look at how people can't even, they can't even figure out how to digest the right information using social media, which is the most yeah. powerful tool yeah. we've ever had. Social yeah. media allows you to, to instantly get the, 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 the brain trust of the smartest people on earth, but instead we're following celebrities or gossip or porn yeah. or nonsense. Yeah. And it's just it's such a waste of time. So if people develop the ability to think critically and they use these tremendously powerful tools around them, in order to yeah. amplify that, there's no excuse in 2023 to not have all of your cards in your hand, ready to play, and your, the, the, the universe is handing you more cards as you go, no matter how poor or rich or old or young or you know, tall or short or anything else you are. These things are available right now at, in a way that they were never available before. I mean, we talked right at the beginning of this or somewhere in the middle about how you know, our ancestors would have given both their, their bollocks to be in the position we're in. But you, you come from a, a, a Scandinavian heritage. You spent a bit of time back there in December, I think, and you, you yeah. kind of went on a bit of a fact-finding mission there as well. What's that all about? And just yeah. tell me a little bit about your history, because even though we've spoken so many times, and I often refer to you as a Viking, I mean, that's really a, an interesting history, and you've actually done a bit of, of work there. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm very proud of my Danish heritage, although, you know, I have an, a deep affinity for South Africa. And, sure. um, and this is you my home, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to live the, my remaining days in South Africa, but but I, I'm so connected to Denmark, I have a huge family there, and friends and so on and so forth. So I think mm. the short story is that, you know, my whole family is Danish, I come from Denmark, my, you know, my lineage is Danish. And my dad was born in a uh, born and raised in a small um, island called Ero Skubing and uh, uh, or Ero and the, the town is called Ero Skubing and my mom is comes from Copenhagen and um, and so I had the opportunity to study there and go to school there and and you know so I was kind of traversing back and forth during my youth Denmark and South Africa and so when I was you know, when I finished studying, I studied advertising. I, I had an opportunity 
in the late 90s to get a really amazing job there. It was with a great agency and, and I was going to get a great job. And at the same time, the TRC was showing in Denmark, they showed it all the time on, on television. And because, I mean, I think only people who grew up in the 80s, you know, in South Africa would really understand this. But as a white male South African or as a white South African, again, this problem with the media and critical thinking, but we were fed a certain narrative, right? And, and, and so in Denmark, all of a sudden, for the first time, really, I actually got the the proper brutal raw truth, you know, like anyone who's read Einke Kroch's Country of My Skull would know like that it, it's it's just so brutal um, in terms of that, that when that truth finally drops, it's, yeah. I mean, it's it's like, it's a Damascene moment. Like it's the scales mm-hmm. from your eyes and you, you have this, it's a, you, it, it cannot not change you, right? So I think from that perspective, I, I, I decided not to take the job in Denmark and actually go back and, and, you know, and, and I, uh, I know this can maybe sound a bit arrogant or whatever, but, but I wanted to play some small part in and participate in just trying to figure out the country that I was just sheltered within and, and lived this completely ridiculously, you know, this, this life in a bubble and actually get amongst it and, and really kind of try and, and figure out some way of navigating through this brutal legacy that, that had been, you know, so real for so many people, yet was so not real for, for this small majority, you know, which was just extraordinary to me. I, I couldn't get my head around it. I read at the same time, Rion Malin's My Trader's Heart, which just blew me away. I mean, I was, I was a wreck after reading that. Anybody who's ever read that knows it's just one of the most hard-hitting books you could ever read. And yeah. so I read that all in Denmark and I came back. And so that sort of set me on the path of, of, really, um, of really kind of trying to figure out how to employ people, how to make a business, how to impact. I very quickly settled upon entrepreneurship as my kind of tool of choice to try and make some form of a difference. You know, I, obviously I have not made a huge impact at all, but I, I, we're starting to, you know, with Heavy Chef, it really is starting to have an impact. And, and that's quite exciting, I think, you know, and, um, and so the journey is still long, Gareth. I mean, there's a lot of, and there's a lot of uh, cheapers. There's a lot of potholes, you know, yeah. literally well, yeah. and, and <laughs> metaphorically, but, but uh but yeah, man, I, you know, I have hope. I mean, I've worked with some of the leaders, you know, I've, I've met um, uh, President Trump, of course. I met, um, um, worked with President Mbeki, you know, and, and people are like, what we must realize is people are flawed individuals. You know, there's all these psychological and, 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 you know, these environmental elements that they need to contend with. And so, I, I mean, this for this to work, it just means that we have to keep on going. We've got to keep on fighting and uh, and try and do it in a way that's 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 fair and equitable um, to as many people as possible. You know, um, maybe that's a bit too philosophical. I don't know, but the reality is, it needs action. You know, we've got to get our hands dirty and get. Stuck I like in. it. So, Fred, what um, what gets you up in the morning? I mean, you've you've given me half an answer there in in what you just said now, but I mean, you've got you've got a, a really different life to most people in Cape Town, and you you know, as a, as an entrepreneur yourself, you kind of manage, I think, from my point of view, anyway, you manage to have quite a lot of balance in your life. Like, uh, I see yeah. stuff on your social media of you heading down to the the beach when everybody else is working, and I often think, <laughs> oh, bloody Cape Townians, uh... you know. <laughs> this uh, this guy just started, his Viking blood is so strong he just can't help being in the sea. But what w- what kind of things do you do to keep yourself energized and and optimistic and and looking for those opportunities? Listen, Gareth, you of all people should should know not to believe everything that you see on social media. <laughs> but 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 I I think to be frank, balance is a, is a huge. Um, it's a it's it's very intentional in my life you know i have three kids um i um you know, i have a family that i'm really passionate about and i've got a group of friends that I, I really love hanging out with but i work bloody hard as well so i work weird hours like i work late at night so i wake up at five every morning i go in for walk in in my garden and you know mess around with my dogs before everyone wakes up and you know i think the thing to answer your question that um that uh 
gets me up every morning. I think it's, and this is a personal belief, I, I, I think that, mm -hmm. um, as you, you may have picked up already in our discussions, I'm a huge fan of Jung. And there's, a, there's an idea that work should not be work, it should be vocation, right? And vocation is, you know, come, the etymology of it is, is the Latin, um, it's the calling, vocation, which is, is what is your calling? What calls you? And I think there is a, you know, without getting too spiritual or, or metaphysical, like I think there is something you 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 know whatever it is that how this weird uh, universe works. You know, when we are created, when we're born, you're given a set of gifts. You know, you you inherit a baton in terms of your makeup and you know that the environment panel beats you into the certain person that has some strengths and weaknesses, right? So within all of that, there's there's a inevitable calling. You are called along a certain path. You know, you can either look at that as intentional, or you just slip into that that you know uh, onto that path. But I think it, it's important to to meditate upon that question and to really think about what that means to you. There are some frameworks so you could look at, like Ikigai, for example, which I'm sure you've you've heard of. The Ikigai, for those who haven't, of your listeners. Is yeah. is you know answering four questions. You know what what are you good at? What do you um, uh, really enjoy doing? What makes you money? And what can change the world in a little way? You know, even if it's a small part of the world. Sure. You know, um, so how can you impact the world in in wh whichever way? And so those four questions, if you if you overlap them like a Venn diagram, there's something there that could be construed as a calling. There's something there that you could say, well, that's the thing that I can actually do. I can be good at it, I can enjoy it, I can make money, and I can actually change the world in a little way. Right? So I, I think if you find that, first of all, it's very intentional, and it takes a while, and, and you've got to try things. You've got to cast the net out, pull it back in, try different things, be curious. You know, Don't be critical about social media and the media in general. And yeah. for me, that thing is, is, is basically... Edu educating entrepreneurs you know so i found something in education which i absolutely love and entrepreneurship which i absolutely love which really drives me it gives me so much energy and just that thing of entrepreneurs like again to the point of disproportionate change you know for me entrepreneurship and being an entrepreneur first of all it's not for everybody it is, no. you know, it is absolutely brutal. Like it can really destroy families and lives and so on and so forth if it's, if it's not your thing, right? But if you are truly that way inclined, um, you know, then it's this amazing creative endeavor. It's, it's possibly the most creative of all the creative endeavors. Because, I mean, if you think of an artist, you'd have a, you know, a, 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 an easel and a canvas and you paint on that. You have boundaries. With an entrepreneur, you can't, you're putting something in your head and you're using the universe as your canvas and you're creating so many different aspects that has so much of an impact. And I think that is just the most unbelievably gratifying endeavor that you could possibly pursue. And I'm eternally grateful for that. Well, I can't think of a better note to end this discussion on, even though we'll no doubt be talking again soon. Keep uh, cool. inspiring. Happy to. As, as you do. And I cannot recommend to anybody uh, more the, the kind of stuff that the kind of content that you guys at Heavy Chef put out. It really is tremendous. And it's great to see that you're flourishing. And I hope you and your family are extremely well and that 2023 brings you all kinds of joy and happiness. Thank you, Gareth. And to you guys as well. I love the conversations. You talk hard truths and uh, sometimes somewhat controversially, but always with the, the heart of uncovering, I believe... Oh, the right, you know, the right outcome. <laughs> the old controversial was maybe worth something back in, I don't know, you know, 2016. <laughs> now every, everybody's controversial. You just open your mouth and say, wow, you know, it's hot today. People are, oh, yeah. my God, global yeah. warming. Yeah. That is controversial. Yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> no, you're right. Yeah. You People so miss, they must grow pay a little bit. I think we South Africans are fairly resilient, so we can take it, you know. I think, but, well, uh, mostly. Well, the world is a strange place at the moment, but but keep on keeping on, keep keep on doing what you do, guys. And your team is amazing. I love those guys. So, yeah, man, all the best to you, twenty twenty three. All right, Fred, and keep well. Thanks again for making time for us. Appreciate it. Cool, absolute pleasure.